Hi again. Today we're going to talk about bonding in covalent molecules. Remember, those are the types of species in which atoms share electrons to obey the octet rule. Now you might wonder what more there is to say about bonding in these kinds of molecules. We've already learned how to do Lewis dot structures like this one to show how electrons are shared, and we've used VSEPR theory to explain why the molecules adopt the shapes they do. But what these theories don't do for us is to explain why the bonds form. That is, what physically holds the molecule together. Nor do they help us predict the energies of the bonds or how the electron clouds, which are found in atomic orbitals in the individual atoms, reconfigure themselves in the resulting molecule. And it's these latter questions we're going to start tackling in this module. Ultimately, we're going to use two completely different models to describe the bonding. The first we call valence bond theory, and the second molecular orbital theory. Now, it will help us to understand each theory by describing one important way in which the two theories differ, and that's this. In valence bond theory, the electrons which make up each bond in a molecule are considered as acting independently of the electrons in all the other bonds. That is, each bond is completely separate and independent of every other bond. You can treat each bond as if all the other bonds weren't even there. That isn't so in molecular orbital theory. In molecular orbital theory, all the electrons in the whole molecule are thought of and treated together so that an electron may be considered spread out over many, many bonding areas on the molecule. This is an important distinction to keep in mind. So let's begin by talking about valence bond theory, and we'll consider molecular orbital theory another time. Now, valence bond theory. You know, from Lewis dot structures and VSCPR, you might get the impression that the electrons in a bond sit between the atoms like colons in a sentence. For example, here's the Lewis dot structure of methane. But we'll see from our discussion that, in fact, the electrons in the bond are in the form of a cloud, just like the electrons in a single atom. Valence bond theory will help us predict what this cloud looks like. Let's begin our discussion with the simplest case of covalent bonding, the situation where two atoms come together to form a diatomic molecule. We'll start with the formation of hydrogen gas. You'll recall that hydrogen is one of those gases that exists in nature as diatomic molecules. Now, how do these diatomic molecules form from individual hydrogen atoms? Well, here's a lone hydrogen atom approaching another one. Each has just one valence electron. Now, just by way of review, what's the name of the atomic orbital of that electron? Can you remember? Here's the periodic table, if that helps. It's the 1s orbital, of course, and it has a spherical shape like all s orbitals. Now, in order to adopt the electron configuration of the closest noble gas, helium, each hydrogen atom is ready to share an electron with the other. We can imagine this happening by the overlap of the two s orbitals like this. You remember from Lewis dot structures that we say that a single bond is now formed between the two hydrogen atoms. And that bond is composed of the two electrons which are shared. But physically, what is the force that's holding the two atoms together? Huh? Well, notice that the electron density between the two nuclei is now larger than on the outsides. This extra electron density pulls on the positively charged nuclei pulls them towards each other, and this is what holds the molecule together. Now you'll see this sort of bond depicted in different ways as drawn in different textbooks. Here's a typical example. Now this would be a good time to define a new term, the bond axis. This is a line which joins the two nuclei held together by the bond. Notice that the electron cloud in this bond lies right along the bond axis. Indeed, it is symmetrical around the bond axis. You can see this if we rotate the molecule. This kind of covalent bond, that is, a bond which is symmetrical about the bond axis, is called a sigma-type bond. 
We'll spend the rest of this module talking only about sigma type bonds. It turns out that sigma type bonds can form in ways other than the overlap between the s orbital on one atom and the s orbital on another. Let's look at an example of a sigma bond forming by the overlap of an s orbital on one atom and the p orbital on another. HCl, which is also called hydrochloric acid, is a good example. Remember from the periodic table that chlorine has seven valence electrons. And from a Lewis dot point of view, when chlorine reacts with hydrogen, the two share electrons to form a diatomic molecule like this. Now let's look at what happens from a valence bond theory perspective. Of course, if chlorine has seven valence electrons, that means it has one unpaired electron in its valence set. So can you tell what kind of orbital that electron adopts? Think about it for a second. In these columns on the periodic table, the type of orbital is p, right? So that unpaired electron on chlorine is a p-type electron. Here's its shape. Now the hydrogen atom with its one s-type electron approaches to form the molecule. The p orbital on chlorine can overlap with the s orbital on hydrogen to form the bond. And what kind of bond is formed? Let's rotate it and see. The electron density is symmetrical around the bond axis, so this bond is a sigma bond. Of course, it's also a single bond, and so one might say this is a single sigma bond. Good tongue twister. Using valence bond theory to describe the bonding in diatomic molecules is fairly straightforward, isn't it? But what happens when we have more than two atoms in the molecule? For example, let's see what happens when we try to use valence bond theory to describe how the bonds form in a molecule like beryllium dichloride. Now to begin, let's remind ourselves about the Lewis dot structure of this molecule. And to do that, here's the periodic table. Note that beryllium is an alkaline earth metal, but it's unique in forming a molecular covalent compound with the nonmetal chlorine in this unusual case. So, here's how the Lewis dot structure looks. Now, from a valence bond point of view, let's look at the electron configuration of beryllium and chlorine. So, we ask ourselves, what are the valence electrons available on each to overlap to form the bond? Well, on chlorine, that's obvious. Just as on the last slide, chlorine has one unpaired p electron that looks like this. What about beryllium? It has two valence electrons, but they're paired in the 2s orbital, right? So if the chlorine tries to come in and overlap to form a bond, it can't. The paired electrons on beryllium aren't available to pair up with the p electron on chlorine. To make overlap possible, we've got to get the electrons on beryllium unpaired, and thus in different orbitals. How are we going to do that? Well, let's look at a diagram that shows all the neighboring orbitals on beryllium and see what our options are. Here we see the n equals 2 level orbitals on beryllium arranged according to their relative energies, the 2s orbital and the 3 2p orbitals. Of course, in the ground state, the electrons find themselves both in the low energy 2s orbital. And of course they have opposite spins or they couldn't occupy the same orbital. But what if we kicked in a little energy and knocked one of these electrons up into the 2p orbital? If we did that, then both electrons would be unpaired and thus available to overlap with the orbital on a chlorine atom to form a bond. Now it turns out that this is a step in the right direction, but we still end up with a problem. Let's take a look. Here's the way the valence electrons look on beryllium once we've bumped an electron up to the 2p level. Now we bring in our first chlorine atom. So far, so good. Now let's bring in the second chlorine atom to form our molecule. Or, or. The problem is that the geometry of the orbitals on beryllium isn't right to allow overlap to occur. What do we do? 
Well, at this point, we need to introduce a clever trick which is used to make valence bond theory work in such cases. The trick is called hybridization. Hybridization is used extensively in valence bond theory, so let's be sure you understand how it's done. Uh, you may be horrified to learn that the standard set of atomic orbitals you learned aren't the only possible solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Other electron waveforms might be used instead, and one can create these standing waveforms from combinations of the common ones you're now familiar with. The practical outcome for our purposes here is that we can create new atomic orbitals on the central beryllium atom, which do allow for convenient overlap of the two chlorine atoms. We do this by hybridizing together the 2s and the 1, 2p orbital on the beryllium atom to create two new daughter orbitals, which are twins, that is, identical new atomic orbitals. You might think of this process like biological hybridization, you know, like crossing a horse and a donkey to get two mule twins. Surprise! Now, in our case, the parents are the 2s orbital and the 2p orbital. The identical twin hybrids look like this. What shall we call them? Well, chemists have decided to name them after their parents, and in fact to give them both the same name, sp. Now what about the energies of these two new orbitals? Actually, as you might expect, the energies of the two orbitals will be the same, and will lie between the energies of the original parent orbitals, like this. Now if we think of the two valence electrons on beryllium as each adopting one of these sp hybrid orbital shapes, the electrons are much better positioned to overlap the p orbitals on the chlorine atoms, like this. Now, the orientation in space we have shown for the two sp-type orbitals on beryllium is not arbitrary, any more than the orientation in space of the three standard p-atomic orbitals is arbitrary. Remember, they have to be 90 degrees from one another. According to the math, the sp orbitals must be 180 degrees apart. And here's the amazing thing. This correctly predicts the geometry of the beryllium dichloride molecule. Think about it. What geometry would VSEPR predict for BECL2? Linear, right? Remember the balloons? So what's nice about the valence bond approach, it not only shows how the bonds form, it also correctly predicts the geometry of the molecule. Notice that each bond in the beryllium dichloride molecule can be considered independently. Each is a sigma bond, and each is a single bond. Well, we've looked at a molecule with two bonds. Why don't we go on now to a molecule with three bonds? We'll choose boron trifluoride. Now, you've probably noticed that there are two things we typically do in preparing to describe the valence bonds in a molecule. We do the Lewis dot structure, and we look at the electron configuration of the central atom. Why don't you hit pause and take a minute to do both? Oh, and here's the periodic table to help you. And here they are. Now, our next job is to identify the atomic orbital on each of the atoms which will overlap to produce the bonds we've shown in the Lewis dot structure. The orbital on fluorine is easy. It's a p orbital, for the same reason we used a p orbital on chlorine in our previous examples. Remember, chlorine and fluorine are both in the same column or family on the periodic table, so their valence electron configurations are identical. But what orbitals are we going to use for the central boron atom? Well, let's see. We're going to need three of them, each with an unpaired electron. We have three electrons, but they're not all unpaired. Two of them occupy the 2s orbital. We're going to have to do the same sort of thing we did with beryllium. We're going to have to hybridize. To do that, let's promote one of the s electrons up to an empty p. Now we hybridize together all three orbitals which have unpaired electrons. And here's a rule of thumb you can count on every time you hybridize orbitals. There are always as many hybrid daughter orbitals as there were parent atomic orbitals. In this case, there are three parents 
so there will be three daughters. Again, they all look alike, identical triplets in this case, and here's what they look like. They all have the same name. Each is called an sp2 orbital. Now when we show them all together around the boron nucleus, you see that they're arranged, pointing to the corners of a triangle. Now we can bring in the fluorine atoms to overlap their p orbitals with the sp2 hybrid orbitals on the central boron atom. Each resulting bond is a sigma bond because the electron density lies along the bond axis. And notice that the geometry of the molecule is exactly what we should have predicted from VSEPR, namely trigonal planar. I imagine by now you're starting to see a pattern here. Let's see if you can predict the valence bond description of the methane molecule, CH4. Hit pause and write out the Lewis dot structure of methane as well as the valence electron configuration of the central carbon atom. And why don't you show it as an energy level diagram? Well, here's the result. Now, what do we need to do next? Why don't you hit pause again and see if you can work it all out on your own? This would be a great learning experience for you. Okay, let's see how close you came. We need four unpaired electrons on the central carbon atom. To get them, we promote one of the two s electrons up to the 2p level. We then hybridize all four orbitals on the carbon atom to form four equivalent sp3 hybrid orbitals. Here they are. Now, they're arranged around the carbon atom this way, each pointing toward the corner of a tetrahedron. The four hydrogen atoms now approach so as to overlap their one s electron with one of the sp3 hybrid orbitals on carbon. Yeah. So we end up with four sigma bonds in the molecule, arranged in a tetrahedral pattern, just as VSEPR would predict. Now, with this introduction, you're ready to tackle some of the finer points of valence bond theory, including what to do when you have lone pairs and double or triple bonds in the molecule. But we'll save those for another time. Toodaloo.